Hey there, and welcome. I'm grateful that you chose to spend some time with me today. You'll be glad you did. I'm excited about today's guest, my own business lawyer, who's here to talk about legal considerations for starting your chronic penure business. But before we get into that interview, I just want to remind you that the Patients Getting Paid membership community is available to help you find and create work that will accommodate your chronic illness. It's a very warm, supportive community that shares every step of their journey and works together to find and create flexible remote work that accommodates chronic illness while generating an income. Head over to PatientsGettingPaid.com to learn more about all the benefits of membership. I hope to see you soon on the inside. Joel Ankney is a lawyer who's been helping freelancers start and run businesses for over 25 years. He's also the author of Before You Leap, a book that walks freelancers through some of the most important legal issues involved in starting and running a business. And he's here today to help us think through what legal needs we may have when starting a chronicpreneur business. Thanks for being here, Joel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Good, me too. So in full disclosure, I think I mentioned this in the intro, but you are my business attorney and you've reviewed some contracts and things for me in the past, which I really appreciated. It helps me, you know, knowing that you're there. I have an established relationship with an attorney. So if I need documents reviewed or I have legal questions come up, I know exactly where to go. And I'm not explaining what my business does and that sort of thing. So you can provide answers specific to my business. And I just... I bring that up because I highly recommend having a Joel on your team if you can. Um, I pay him when I utilize his services only. There's no retainer. A lot of people ask a lot of these types of questions about attorneys, sure, but sure. knowing he's right there helps me sleep at night. Um, you know, he's one of my team, which makes me feel better. So since COVID and the great resignation, so many people are starting businesses, taking advantage of the new remote work mentality in the world now, hallelujah. I would assume that you're seeing that in your work, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it is a, and, and I'm actually encouraging people to do that. Um, uh, and it hits close to home as well. I have a, a, a son in his mid twenties that is, you know, trying to figure out how to survive in this economy. And, and mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we come from a line of, of entrepreneurs and so, um, I think that, you know, starting your own business is a fabulous idea if you have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the interest and in the, and perhaps the, you know, the, the discipline, it takes some self-discipline to do that um, as well. But I, honestly, I think the investment is one of the better investments you can make in yourself because in a year or two after you start, you're going to realize that you're, you know, typically much happier and you enjoy your work and you're making good money as well. So um, yeah. those are all great things. I love that you use the term investing in yourself. That's the way I look at it too. And it does, it, it, it's important to say what you said about it is hard work and it takes discipline, but there's rewards on the other end. So I love that you said that. And I love your book. I really do because it's comprehensive and it's laid out in a very clear way, starting with um, starting a gig economy business and then intellectual property, contracting with clients, client disputes, getting legal help and next steps, which I love. I really appreciate the clarity of that layout because you can kind of, it's all there, but you can go to where you, you know, what you need right then. So right. Um, let's start with this. What what is the gig economy and what do we need to know going into it? Yeah, the, you know, the gig economy, I think, has always existed. Um, it's just a, a new label for uh, a, a kind of a, you know, an economy or, or a type of work that, that has been around for many, many, I mean, centuries probably. But, mm -hmm. but essentially, it's a freelance economy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an economy it's a, a, where you can... Um, set up your own business and get gigs or get projects or whatever you want to call them um, to provide your freelance services or to sell your products or, or whatever it is you're doing. And um, so gig economy is just kind of the cool, new, trendy way to, to label the, the, that, that particular type of work. Um, but it's really, you know, freelancers, consultants, 
independent contractors. And that economy has existed for, like I said, for, for a long time. But it's really blossomed here recently, hasn't it? <laughs> it, it has. And I, and I love that. And, and one of Me the reasons too. why it's blossomed is because I guess there are two factors. One is that um, technology just levels yes. the playing field. I mean, 100%. technology, you know, I, I honestly, I used to work uh, many years ago for a very large law firm. And when I started my own practice, um, my own law practice, um, I was able to do things with technology that I couldn't do inside the big law firm mm -hmm. uh, because they were, you know, concerned about their internal systems and things like that and, and consistency. And I can try whatever I want. I can try an app. I can try a piece of software or a right. different, you know, or launch a blog or whatever I want to do. So technology yeah. is, it levels the playing field. And I think the other thing that uh, has happened in it, and it's really accelerated because of COVID, but more people, more businesses are willing to outsource, mm. um, you know, uh, work than, right. than in the past. Now, I think COVID has accelerated that yes. as well. And that's, I think that's great. I think that's, yes. it, you know, that's one good thing that came out of COVID for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I always reference how, um, because I've been in this patient advocacy world for quite a while now, and um, I've encouraged others to look into that or to start their own businesses that, that have chronic illness, because a lot of folks with chronic illness and disability uh, have been shut out of of employment in a lot of circumstances, a lot of situations, because a lot of these companies would not hire remote workers. And it was really silly. I'm choosing my words carefully here. <laughs> Stupid comes to mind. It was very short-sighted on, on, um, on their part because they were missing out on this fabulous labor pool and, you know, uh, think tank that exists, right? And right. from our perspective, we still have so much to give to the world, but why should that be lessened because we don't feel well or we have to wait in the morning, we can't drive somewhere because we have to wait for our meds to kick in or something. It, it was really, it was silly and I think it was born of fear and this notion that um, if, if you don't have your employees in your site, they're going to somehow, I don't know what they're going to do. They're not going to be doing their work. Right. It's really, it's really silly. But point being COVID forced their hand and what they saw was their productivity in a lot of cases, not only did, did it not go down, but it went up and you saw, you know, um, you saw the employee being much happier because it was integrated. Their life, their business, and their and their their work and their home life were integrated, which that makes sense. That makes sense for a lot of people. I just before I jumped on here, I threw in a load of laundry, so the, I don't have to wait until I get home from work to do. You know, my my second job doesn't start then. It's kind of all combined, and it's just made my life better. So I. I'm going to crawl off my um, soapbox now, but this is what I think has happened that's such a boon for us as chronic preneurs and folks with disabilities that were, we were shut out prior, and now this exists, and it's, it's a really exciting time, I think. So, I, okay. I think you've touched, yeah, I think you've touched on one of the really big benefits of being a freelancer, and that is you control your schedule, and you can... <laughs> You know, and, and there's nobody uh, kind of looking over your shoulder to see if you're at your desk or at your computer or something like that. Right. And um, I, I think that's an amazing, I mean, you know, if you if you work better at 10 o'clock at night, nobody really cares. Yeah. Um, and so I think that freedom of, of, you know, and that independence of controlling your schedule is a huge benefit of being a freelancer. 100%. Um, and certainly for someone with chronic illness, I work from my bed. I work from my recliner. I work from the hospital infusion center. And why not? I mean, I was missing out on that benefit in my life, being able to work and share my knowledge and everything. And, and the world was missing out on my work product. Why? Because I wasn't sitting in a cubicle. That's pretty dumb. <laughs> so yay, we okay. agree that that was great. <laughs> yeah. Yay. We're in a great time. So, okay. At what point do you think someone should hire a lawyer? Well, I, uh, people have asked me that question for decades. I bet. And I have <laughs> distilled down my answer to this. 
hire the lawyer before, not after. Mm. And that, that seems really kind of trite, but I mean, um, it, it, there's no bright line rule of when the, you know, the time is to hire the lawyer, but I don't, you know, if you're going to do something that has a legal impact or legal risks, hire the lawyer before you do it rather than after. Um, and, and I could ask you, I could really throw the question back at you and just say, you know, why did you decide to contact me or when did you decide, you know, what, mm -hmm. what, what was it that, that gave you that motivation to say, okay, I think now's the time to talk to somebody. For me, it was because uh, my ass was on the line. That's the truth. Because a company had contract, uh, contacted me and wanted to contract with me. And mm -hmm. it was a it was a really long and arduous um, contract that I didn't understand everything. And yeah. I thought, this is really important. I got to know what I'm signing. And I don't want to be giving away any, I don't want to give away my business. I mean, you know, you hear these horror stories. So just knowing that your eyes had been on there and you and I talked back and forth about how we could make some adjustments that, you know, prote mm -hmm. better protected me, um, which thankfully they had no issue with, uh, it made me feel so much better. I mean, I referenced that earlier, but that's no joke. I feel like I can sleep better because you're a phone call away. <laughs> so whatever comes my way, if I, if I feel any trepidation toward it, I'm like, I got to call Joel. And that just yeah, makes me feel that. so much better. Yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, honestly, as, as over the years, as we um, tried to, you know, create a, a branding message for, for my legal services, that's been the message I've tried to convey to people is that, you know, you let me worry about it because yeah. I worry about it all the time. And, and hopefully you can sleep better that you'll feel less anxious about the process. Now, I, I, what I love, you know, I did ask you that question about why did you decide to call me? And, and you decided to call me because there, like you said, there was something on the line. There was a contract that was presented to you. That's, that's kind of a real natural uh, trigger for calling a lawyer. But a lot of the stuff in the book talks about things, legal issues that you should be thinking about and addressing uh, before somebody else comes at you, for example. Right. And, and so really, <clears throat> you know, the idea of when should you call a lawyer to help with these things is probably when you start to, you know, not be able to sleep at night. I think. <laughs> That's a um, good one. Yeah. And, and then, you know, and, and, and depending on who the lawyer is, because we're, we come in all different, you know, flavors, but yeah. um, a lot of lawyers that I work with and that I know will tell you if you're too early, they'll tell you, you know, if, if you've come too early, um, I'll let you know. And I'll say, come back to me, you know, when these three things happen or when mm -hmm. you're ready to do these three things. Um, so if somebody comes to me early, that's fantastic. That's yeah. great. If somebody comes to me late, that's really tough for like, yeah. if you had already signed those contracts yeah. and came to me and said, Hey, would you take a look? And this happens to me frequently. People wow. will come to me and say, we've already signed the contracts or we've already done the deal, but now I'm nervous. And will you take a look at this? And it's a shame because sometimes I'll be like, well, if you had come to me beforehand, you know, we could have perhaps resolved some of these issues up front. I could have told you what the risks were and we right. and I could have told you, what I think are the kind of the customary and reasonable ways to resolve these risks. Yeah. And, uh, and we probably wouldn't have gotten much pushback, but yeah. It's so, so before rather than after it's really the, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb, I think. Yeah. I like what you just said about, um, that you likely not to get much pushback. And I don't know that that's true in all circumstances, but just to share mine, I was nervous about, coming back in that contracting process with my changes and um i thought they were quite substantial and they 100 percent protected me and took some things off the table that obviously they wanted because it was in the original contract so i was a little nervous about bringing that back to them they did not blink that was they had no issues with that and so i think that that's important for people to hear that um nothing's 
nothing's you know set in stone and if you have someone on your side like a Joel Ankney who reads through this stuff and says well let's tighten up this language a little bit to protect you down the road or maybe we could change this or what are you really hoping to get out of that let's put that in there and you bring it back that's you know that's not unusual and that's not like a slap in the face to that company and I'm telling you I've done this more than once and they've never had an issue with it I'm not making, you know, I'm not asking them to make huge concessions either, but right. I'm asking them to make some concessions and nobody has a problem with it. And the bottom line is, you know, my teammate, uh, Joel Ankney has just covered me on this and I, in ways I would never have had the foresight to do because he's an attorney and I'm not, <laughs> that's the, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that the, the, Part of what I bring to the table is that I've done this for so many years that um, I generally am not asking people to do, you know, when I ask for changes to contracts, I'm not asking for crazy things. I'm, right. I'm not, I, you know, I, I know, you know, I've done hundreds of these types of contracts and I know what's customary and I know what, you know, what's reasonable to ask for. And so, you know, part of my strategy is to protect you, but also not to blow the deal up. You know, I don't want right. to, right. I, I don't want to be the, the There's person. There's a fine who, line. Yeah, there, yeah. there is. And, and uh, but I, I can't, I can't really explain why you didn't get any pushback. There are probably a lot of different reasons, but I'm hoping that part of the reason was that we just asked for things that were reasonable. It was customary. reasonable. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. It wasn't anything so, cray cray. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I hear this question in the PGP community all the time. Do I need an LLC or a corporation? So I don't, I know that this isn't cookie cutter. It's really probably specific to each business, but what do you, what do you say to that as a general question? Well, I think the default answer is, yeah, you sh you should yes. seriously consider it. You know, the, the, there are a lot of benefits to having an LLC or a corporation. Um, I mean, just from a, a non-legal perspective, it just makes it look like you're a business that you're, right. you, you know, bring some sure. credibility to what you're doing. Um, it also allows you to open up, you know, separate bank accounts and have, you know, keep separate books and records. And that's a big, um, uh, that means a lot because you want to segregate your personal cash and assets from your business cash yes. and assets. And so it, it creates, an LLC or a corporation essentially creates a bucket where you're going to put all your business assets and your business cash and things like that. And, you know, heaven forbid, if you ever have a problem and somebody wants to try and sue you for a refund or something like that, they can only get to what's in that bucket. They can't right. get to your, your other, your personal stuff. And so that's a, a real big reason to have a, a separate LLC or a corporation. I agree. Um, and it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal to put these things no. together. I mean, I think that no. it can sound, you know, intimidating, but it's really not. I mean, well, especially I if you're a, if you're the only person who owns the LLC or corporation, mm -hmm. that that makes it very simple to to put together. So mm -hmm. it's when you start to have multiple owners that it gets a little stickier. Right. And then you really really need an attorney. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so people are often confused about the definition of an employee versus a contractor. Can you clarify that? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a principle called worker classification, or sometimes it's called worker misclassification. Mm. Um, a lot of times we refer to workers based on the type of IRS form, form. that they get. Yeah, yeah. 1099 so we, we, versus W-2. Yeah. Right. So a 1099 is an independent contractor and a W-2 is, is an employee. Mm -hmm. um, and there are differences. And um, it, it's generally not a huge issue for the freelancer. It's really more of a, you know, it's a much bigger issue for the person or the business who's engaging them for services. If they get that classification wrong, they have the potential to you know, um, be assessed some back taxes, some civil penalties, interest, things like that. And in Virginia, it does make a difference from the, the freelancers perspective in Virginia, because in 2020, the Virginia General Assembly passed some uh, a law about worker classification that now gives a worker 
the uh, the right to sue the business, the the employer essentially, if they get the classification wrong. Mm. That that didn't exist before. And if they win that lawsuit, they can get things like, you know, benefits that they should have received, like health insurance. They can even get crazy things like if they if they were misclassified and they had to pay for medical expenses or health insurance themselves, they can get reimbursed for that. Wow. They can get, you know, other types of damages. They can even get their legal fees paid for. Um, so wow. it's it's an interesting, and it all comes down to the IRS has a test. Um, it's not a real easy test to find the answers to, but the IRS has a test um, that, and, and a number of factors, I can't remember, I think it might be 28 different factors. Uh, but I, I have, at the end, I think you're going to ask me to give my website out, um, yep. and I'm happy to do that. But <clears throat> on there, I have some blog posts about what the IRS test is, goes into some detail, Great. and um, also explaining the, the new Virginia law. But from a freelancer's perspective, again, it's typically not their biggest issue. It's typically a big issue for the business that's hiring them. Mm -hmm. um, if they, and, and so, but it's good to know. You know it's it is. Good and to know about. from a freelancer's perspective, so this, this I'm just learning now as I go, um, as a contractor, um, they, the, the, the company that has hired you cannot dictate to you that you have to be at work at do doing work at specific times. Is that correct? Is that, that part of that it? is definitely that's definitely part of it. I mean, it, that's in, huge. In one of the factors that the IRS looks at is how much control the the employer or the business has over the independent contractor, the freelancer. If they have a lot, if they you know exert a lot of control, then they're at risk of misclassifying their contractor or their freelancer as a as an, uh, you know, as a contractor instead of an employee. So mm -hmm. that's a big risk for them. So as an, if I'm, you know, I do um, um, advise employers many times when they're hiring freelancers and contractors. And one of the things we have a very serious discussion about is what's our, what's the agreement going to look like? And we got to make sure that we're not you know, uh, exerting so much control over them that, that it's going to create a problem for us as far as classification goes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, telling somebody that they've got to be um, at their desk a certain number of hours or between a certain number, it, 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 again, there's not a, I can't say that's definitely a problem because if the freelancer is providing some sort of a service that requires them to be right. at, at the desk, you know, if they're a uh, customer service and they uh, representative and they're going to have to be able to respond between, you know, particular hours, then no, that's not going to be that big of an issue. Right. But on the other hand, if they're editing video or building a website or um, doing medical transcription or something like yeah. that. and Kind of project based. And the, yeah, exactly. And the business says you have to be doing this from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m every day that that's a problem yeah yeah that's that's too much control i would say right i agree and um a real life i guess instance of this for me is that i have a contract with a company and i do live chats for them sunday through thursday and it's at specific times but mm -hmm. that's the that's the entire definition of what i do for them so it would need to be at specific times right. And right, they're not, absolutely. you know, saying you have to be at the desk at this time either. I do it all on my phone. So I can be anywhere, which is the beauty of having chosen exactly this contract. But um, yeah, so to your point, I mean, there are those instances where it, it is going to be necessary to, 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 you know, say you need to be there at these certain times and that doesn't really trigger yeah. a W-2. <laughs> You're still a, a contractor, but. So there's there's and some gray area in there, but there Good there is it's a little it's a little squishy. And the reason why um, employers or businesses would prefer to have you classified as a 1099 is because it saves them uh, on making you know they don't have to pay for your benefits, they don't have to provide you the same benefits that they provide their W two employees, and they don't have to withhold. Uh, payroll right. taxes either. Yeah. And so it is a benefit to them. And that's why the IRS yes. is so um, attentive to this issue, because it can be abused. 
And, yes. And one of the ways that it, it, it tends to, or it could be abused, or I've seen it be abused, is where a business essentially treats a 1099 contractor uh, or freelancer the same way. In other words, they do the kind of things that you're talking about. They require them to um, be at their desk at, for certain hours. And those hours aren't related to any to the services provided. They do things like they say, if you want to take vacation, you're only allowed to take, you know, one week off a year and you have to put in a request to be able to, you know, to us and get it approved. I mean, they, so essentially they build their contract and their freelance relationship to look just like it would look if they were an employee, right. but they're getting the benefits of not having to, you know, pay for benefits. Give them benefits. And, <laughs> right. Or, and, and, and do payroll withholdings and things like right. that. So yeah, that, that's why it's such a hot issue. Really, It is frankly. a hot issue. And yeah. <clears throat> what I discovered embarrassingly so I must say because I've been doing this for a long time and I it just it never came up so I didn't I didn't understand this bit of nuance but because you're not an employee and there are no payroll withholdings if you lose say a big contract and that's you know a major dent to your uh, to your income um, you cannot because you are 1099, you cannot draw unemployment. That has not been um, taken with those payroll uh, um, withholdings. So there's no unemployment for you, which again, I'm embarrassed that I didn't know that, but I didn't know that and I wanna get that out there to everyone <laughs> because I guess that just speaks to then if this is your path, you need to have a significant emergency savings because there's not that sort of social safety net for you. And I know there's been yeah. some discussion, particularly during COVID and like the um, Lyft workers and Uber workers saying like, right. we need to work something out here because that's untenable. But I, I don't know that they've done anything about that. I, you know, I, I think you, you bring up two really good points, um, and you're right. I mean, the, the general rule is that if you're a 1099 contractor and you lose a contract, you can't go uh, apply for unemployment. Um, I feel like, and, and I can't really speak to this with a lot of uh, knowledge, but I feel like, you know, in 2020 and 2021, there were some um some laws and regulations that were instituted that allowed freelancers to apply for unemployment, but I think those were temporary programs, and I, I, I don't think that they. Yeah, they expired anymore. in twenty one. Yep, yep, yeah. I know that to be true. But I, I do feel like that there, there's sort of this coalition of folks pressing for more to be done on right. that. I mean, I, well, I was going to say I'd be happy to pay in to know that I had unemployment, but really I can just bulk up my emergency savings and it's going to do the same thing. So I just wanted to yeah. put that out there to everyone because, you know, I don't know, silly me, shame on me. I never knew that. So I want to share my <laughs> newfound knowledge. Yeah. Be careful. So in, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to rate, I don't know if I would want to look into this, but if you, you asked me this question about if you have an LLC or a corporation, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's possible. I, I don't know. I'd have to, I don't want to misspeak here, but if you have an LLC or a corporation, you've been a 1099 and you, but then you lose a big contract and you decide to close the business. Mm -hmm. I think at that point you're self-employed. I think you can go apply for unemployment, but I'm not sure about mm, that. Interesting. But, but yeah, but that, that means, you know, that's dramatic, right? That means you're shutting everything down and you're not right. going to do anything more. But for example, me, you know, I have my own law practice. I have a corporation. Um, I'm essentially a freelancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I freelance my legal services. But if I were to close my business, I think I could go apply for unemployment uh, as long as I'm looking looking for another job. But but I don't well, know. I mean, that's, that's that sounds like a blog post waiting to happen. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, let's, <laughs> I just let's, gave let's, you let's, some uh, ideas for content, Joel. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> sure. Um, so. Um, what what's a commonly overlooked legal issue when running a freelancer consulting business? What do people just not pay attention to uh, that they need yeah, to? Yeah, I think yeah, the thing that that jumps out at me is that um, work product ownership is mm. a kind of a minefield sometimes. That's a good one. Um, yes, because you, you 
you know, even, and, and, and it's, it's not really a do it yourself kind of thing. I mean, a lot of contracts will, a lot of freelance contracts might have a provision in there addressing work product ownership, but, but most of the ones I've seen that uh, are even sometimes when they're drafted by a lawyer uh, aren't enough. They, they're not legally enough. Um, the, the default rule generally is the person who creates the work product owns it. And uh, of course we hear this term work for hire or work made for hire. And we think that if we put that, tip, that term in the contract that that's enough to transfer ownership, but it's not. Um, work for hire, work made for hire is a very narrow concept under the Copyright Act. And, and most of the work product that people, that freelancers are developing are, is work product that's protected by the Copyright Act. Mm. But in the Copyright Act, work made for hire is, is narrowly defined. And uh, most work product that, that freelancers are creating don't fall within that definition. So the language that needs to be used in their contracts needs to be a little bit more magical, I guess. Mm -hmm. It needs to it needs to not just say it's a work made for hire, but it needs to say something to the effect of, you know, to the extent it's not a work made for hire, you know, the I'll the contractor, the freelancer assigns the ownership over to the the client and will, you know, in the future, if the client asks, will sign any other transfer documents that are yeah. necessary. That's, yeah. That's a gem general approach. So. Yeah. And isn't this also uh, another term for this is intellectual property rights? Yeah, absolutely. Is that true? Yeah. I, I, Just so I, people I, I, understand yeah. that that's yeah. what's being um, referenced. Yep. So, as an example, I mean, that's um, you really helped me with this because um, I had been courted by a. Uh, a um, network, a podcasting network that wanted to take my podcast on and um, their, I felt like their contract was really pretty broad and um, we determined that it, it was in fact broad in, in that language and it seemed that they were going to own my podcasts um, even beyond the time of the contract. So that that's one of the changes that we made. And I'm so grateful because, you know, if something goes sideways in our relationship, oh my gosh, I've worked so hard on these podcasts and it's not this podcast, by the way, it was FUMS, but um, to think that I would just lose that uh, work product and not be able to capitalize on it and use it and share it and everything else was that would have been devastating, but I don't think, particularly at the point at which I was then, I, I would not have had the foresight to, to think that through and recognize that that could be a problem. I mean, everything's hunky-dory, right? Yeah, everybody loves right. everybody at the right. beginning of the contract. Right. Right. Um, so there's another reason to have an attorney who, you know, doesn't have a dog in this hunt and is going to look through this with the agenda that you are there they're looking out for you. So you really had my back on that one and said, you know, let's think this through and maybe we need to change some verbiage here and so that yeah. you own this, which was fantastic. So another well, reason and, to get and, a good attorney. <laughs> and, and related to that work product ownership issue is uh, for a freelancer is if, if you do transfer, you know, every, if the contract reads really well and the, the provision is uh, correct, and you actually are transferring ownership to the work product or the intellectual property rights, you have to remember that you then can't go back and use that stuff for your portfolio. Later, and, right. And, and so, you know, that's why we want to have typically a carve-out provision in there as well that says, you know, as long as it's not confidential information, you're going to grant us the right, me, the freelancer, the right to use this work in my portfolio, you know, yeah. if I'm a graphic designer, I want to be able to show people my work, show them. I, right? you know, yeah. So, and, and if that's not in there in your contract, then you're not going to have a right to do that. Right. 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 So maybe one of the contracts I'm, I'm jumping a bit, but one of the contracts that I would assume that you suggest folks have is something with maybe a little bit, some teeth in it to compel clients to pay. Because this is something that can be a big fat issue. Right. And right. also, just throwing out something else that I have learned um, is to really pay attention in your contracts as to 
when they pay. So I had a contract come across my desk that was net 90, meaning that they wouldn't pay me for 90 days. And right. I get why that would be good for them, but that's really bad for me because <laughs> I have bills right, that are right. due well before 90 days. So that was sure. untenable for me and I needed to change that. So I just want, I want to give everybody a heads up to look for that little nuanced weirdness in a contract. But so I would suggest that, I mean, I would imagine that one of the things that you suggest is if you're trying to collect, um, you know, doing invoicing, that sort of thing, that you have some sort of contract with some teeth to be able to get your clients to pay. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I think having a contract is important. And the, the way that that contract, you know, the, the form that it takes is really kind of flexible. Like, for example, you know, you could have a um, uh, just terms of use on your on your website and they have to just click twice to say they agree or something like that. Or, you know, for example, lawyers generally send out engagement letters when they um, when people want to engage them. And those, when I started practicing law 30 years ago, those engagement letters were these really long, lengthy kind of letters. And I found out that my clients didn't really, they, 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 their eyes them. glazed over. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> right. Um, and so then I started this practice where I just have a PDF mm -hmm. that's a very easy, plain English understanding, you know, uh, attachment. And I just send an email saying, hey, I'm excited to work with you. My engagement terms are attached. If you have any questions, let me know. If you agree, just send me an email back that says green light, we're ready to go. So right. you don't have to be like super formal about the way you do your contract or present your contract, but you're right. It, it, you're absolutely right. If you're going to have a problem, you know, in the future, um, it's so much easier to resolve that problem if you've got a contract that you can refer back to and say, no, you know, you, you know, we agreed to net 30 days. And it's 45 days. Um, and so I, I, I need my money. Yeah. Um, there are other things that help, I think, with collections. One is, like you said, just having a good invoicing, regular good invoicing system and a follow-up system for collecting. You know, mm -hmm. I, I actually have software where I send my invoices out um, and then, you know, by email and then I have a, in the software application, I have a system set up so that at 45 days, an email automatically goes out a mm -hmm. reminder at, at 60 days, another one goes out at 90 days, another one goes out. So I've tried to automate my collection and it's actually been wonderful. It's worked That's so, so well. because it, It's funny to me because I forget that that automated system is there. And then um, usually like, uh, you know, 45 or 60 days out, all of a sudden, I'll start getting people paying by credit card and I'll, I'll be like, Oh yeah, today's the 60th day. <laughs> right. So everybody's getting their automatic reminder. Oh, so it's, gosh. yeah, it's, it's, you know, to make oh, life easier, uh, it, that, that helps a lot. Yeah. Automation is so important. I think for anybody, but especially if you've got a chronic illness, um, and, and it impacts your thinking at all. I have yeah, cog yeah. fog often and to try and keep mm. all that stuff straight. That's not possible. So I could not do what I'm doing now. I couldn't have done it decades ago prior to all the automation and the technology. I, I would I would not have been able to handle it. So I'm grateful. I know at the start of this, I was telling you that I hate tech, and I do. I have a love-hate relationship. I love it when it's working, but if there's right. any blip, I hate it. But Can, so, I, can I mention one please. more thing yeah. about a contract? to help on the collection side. And that is, you know, in the American legal system, um, it's, you pay for your own legal fee. So if you yeah. have to actually sue somebody to collect on a, on a, a, an account, you're going to have to pay your own legal fees. But mm -hmm. the American legal system also allows you to put in your contract a provision called a fee shifting provision. And this essentially just says, if I have to collect, you're going to pay not only what you owe me, but you're also going to pay my legal fees. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is, it, it's great. That's huge. You know, if you do have to file a lawsuit, but it's actually also a really good piece of leverage to have when you're negotiating yeah. a collection because your client, you know, knows that if they don't pay you, that they're also risking the fact that they're going to have to pay your legal fees as well. Yeah. So I see a lot of people, 
when they have that in their contract, it, it helps settle things Smart. much quicker. Smart. Yeah. I like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are quite a few online like legal document services that have right. various contracts and documents available, and it's quite inexpensive. Why not just do that? Um, I think that, I mean, it's a one size fits all approach. And, um, but most people need something a little more custom. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I actually have clients who, who do that and then come in and ask me to fix uh, some of the things that they judge it a little bit for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> let's take a real specific example. If you're setting up a corporation or an LLC and you want some sort of a special status, like a woman owned business or a, a service disabled veteran owned business or something like that, in order to qualify for that special status, your legal documents need to have certain language in them. Um, when you use one of these online services, you're not going to get that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get that customization. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you're going to risk losing that, that qualification or that special status. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that jumps out at me. But it, yeah, it's really just um, the, the ability for the lawyer to ask you questions, understand who you are and what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish so that they can customize the, yeah. the, the setup for you. And really co CYA, <laughs> yeah. which is the key. Um, so what should you expect to pay a business attorney to help you get set up in your business and kind of equip you with some basic contracts? Obviously, it's very individually based on how intricate the services are that you need from, right. from an attorney. But just in general, is it an and this is the big one, because there's I'm sure you know this. There's so much fear around hiring an attorney. I get questions yeah. all the time like I, I've been asked so many times if I have a quick question for my attorney am I going to get billed for that they're f afraid of the surprise bills and the, all that so yeah. just in general what would you think that you is kind of customary if it's not too crazy <laughs> a lot of yeah a lot of lawyers have a flat fee that they charge to set up an LLC or a corporation and I've seen those flat fees be anywhere between you know, five or six hundred dollars to twelve hundred dollars, mm -hmm. um, um, and so you know you can kind of shop around for that. Yeah. Um, when you're asking about uh, creating contracts or terms of use or or things like that, um, I think you could easily spend, you know, maybe you know budget a thousand dollars for something like that. Um, mm -hmm. um, maybe less, maybe more, but I think your budget should be. Uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars probably. Um, mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Some lawyers are willing, and I'm one of those lawyers, uh, who are willing to do what they call limp representation. Um, sometimes bundled legal services or a la carte legal services. And so, you know, if, a, if I have a client who wants to try their hand at drafting a contract and then bringing it to me and, and just paying for me to review it, mm -hmm. I'm happy to do that. If I have a client who wants to form their own LLC and, you know, bring me the documents, the operating agreement or something like that to me and ask me to provide input on it, um, that'll, that'll cost less than mm -hmm. you know, setting it up. Now, some attorneys won't, they won't do that. Some attorneys will not do limited scope representation um, for various reasons. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I think it's okay. And then to address your last question about, am I going to get billed for emails or telephone calls or something like that, mm -hmm. that you, you should probably anticipate that the answer is going to be yes. Mm -hmm. Um, unless you talk to the attorney ahead of time about that, um, and ask what their policy is. You know, if you call me up and we spend three minutes on the phone, I probably am not going to charge you with for that unless I saved you like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, right. I mean, my you then know, part I of what I pay that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of what I sell is my knowledge and my experience and my expertise. Um, and so, an email or a phone call um, may, you know, either help you gain a lot of money or save a lot of money. So there's there's value to that. 100%. But I, I honestly, any lawyer you work with. I, I, I would hope that you would see that lawyer as an equal, not a superior, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And if they're really on your team, 
you should be able to communicate with them and, and ask them things and they should be able to communicate back with you. I mean, if you have, you know, I had a, law, a client email me the other day with about 10 or 15 questions in their email, very extensive new project that they're thinking about and then saying to me, could I do it for $250? <laughs> and I emailed them back and I said, no. In yeah. fact, it's probably a $5,000 project. Mm. And they need to know that. And I, right. I don't want to get, you know, so I, I think communication is key Agreed. between the lawyer and the and the client. I'm not the best at it all the time, but um, I want my clients to ask me the tough questions, like how much yeah. is this going to cost? And, you know, if, if we, you know, do, you know, is there a way I can do some of this myself and maybe save on my legal fees a little bit? Yeah. I mean, those are all, those are all very valid questions. Yes, they are. And I like what you said about that, you know, if if this is basically if this is your team member, you should be able to speak to them as a team member, right? I like that. Right, That's so right. true. So let's assume that people are bootstrapping their startup business. What is the bare minimum that they need to be sure they get right, right from the start and might be worth hiring an attorney just for these things? I think the two things that we've talked about already, setting up an entity, an LLC, or a corporation, and getting a kind of a standard or a template contract or terms of use or engagement terms in place. Yeah. Um, those are really the the things that are going to protect you the most from a from a legal perspective. Um, Makes sense. After that, there's hopefully if your business is just chugging along and there's there's not any real big issues, you're not going to need a lot of legal help. Right. Um, Sometimes you'll, uh, if you get a big client, I, I have a software developer that, that routinely uh, does freelance work for Fortune 100 companies. And a lot of times those companies won't sign your contract, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't have one. You present it to them. They may present you back with their template contract. You, you, you'll want to have a lawyer take a look at that yeah, uh, for, for sure. But, right. but really just the, the, the setup and the, the, terms and conditions, the engagement terms, the contract. I think those are those are key because they're going to help you um, either avoid legal issues down the road or they're going to help you resolve them much easier and much more in your favor if, if problems come up. Yeah, good point. So I really appreciate you being here and answering some common questions from chronicpreneurs. Your book is a wonderful resource and I highly recommend it to anyone even considering starting their own business. You can find that at patientsgettingpaid.com slash legal help. This and all the other links from this episode will be in the show notes. Just go to patientsgettingpaid.com slash podcast to find the show notes for all the PGP podcast episodes. Uh, you've made a lovely offer for PGP listeners. Why don't you share it with them and tell them how to take advantage of your gift? Yeah, sure. I, um, so my book is available in print, ebook, and audiobook formats. And, and you can get all those at Amazon if you just search my name, um, but um, but Audible allows me to offer promotional copies of the audio book. And I would love to offer up, you know, 20 or 25 of those audio, let's say 25, let's go with you. Hey, you told me I could be, yes. so let's say 20, Fantastic. Let's do 25. And, and if you're the 26th person who contacts <laughs> me, you'll probably get it anyway. Um, <laughs> but the, the way to get that is to send me an email. Okay. Um, and just refer to patients getting paid podcast in the email. So I know where you're coming from, but you just send me an email. My email address is my name, Joel, J O E L at J A. Those are my initials, J A law office.com. So Joel at J A law office.com. Tell me you heard about it on the patients getting paid podcast. And I will email you back a complimentary code that you can then plug into audible Wow, and you can get a free audio book. That so. is a great gift. Thank you for that. And if people want to find <clears throat> those blog posts you were talking about and the one that you're going to write now that I gave you that idea, where do they yeah. go? <laughs> so my uh, law firm's website is inknylaw.com. Um, I don't know if you can see my name up yes, behind me. Yes, backwards, but, but sure. Backwards, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that's a sign on the um, yeah. But yeah, inkney, A-N-K-N-E-Y law.com. You can just Google my name. I'm the only one out there, but, um, and there's a blog on the website. It's easy to find. 
Excellent. And that will all be in the show notes as well. Clickable links. So thanks so much for being here, Joel. I know this is really going to help people in thinking through what they need for their chronicpreneur business legally. Thanks again. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great. 